Every revolution in the world's history has required bloodshed, but the followers of Jesus can be part of a revolution without firing a single shot. And Jerry's going to be talking about that right now. See you guys. Uh, we're in the second week of a series that we've entitled Don't Settle for Christian. And we've been talking a lot about this word Christian. If you weren't here last week, you missed it. You can go back and uh, pick up on our, um, on our app and, uh, and catch up with what we've been doing. We've been talking about this word Christian. And we've been talking about it because it's a word that, that no one can really define. If I was to ask all of you to get together, to get in groups and come up with a definition of Christian, we'd get all kind of uh, d different definitions. Um, it, it's certainly not defined anywhere in the Bible. Uh, we said last week that you can attach Christian to just about anything that you want and make it mean just about anything that you want, to, want it to mean. That's why there are people on both sides of every issue who claim to be Christians. Uh, you'll see when it's a political season, which used to be every four years. Now I think it's every four days. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, you, you can, there's people on both sides of about every political argument who call themselves Christians, even though uh, they're on different sides. There are many denominations who call themselves Christians, and, and there are people who call themselves Christian, and some of them you don't even want to be around. You know, they're just not nice people, and yet they call themselves Christian. And the reason why there's, there's so much confusion around this word uh, is because the word itself, as we saw last week, Christian, was actually a word that was manufactured by people in the first century who were not followers of Jesus Christ. And they would look at these people who were followers of Jesus Christ, and they began to call them Christians. And it was kind of a derogatory term. I was reading a book this week and said, if you, if you think about it, and Carol and I were talking about this yesterday, it's really kind of weird because Rome said that Caesar was God. And technically, then, that means that if you were a Christian, that you were an atheist to them. And they would, we, they would look at them as atheists just like we look at atheists and say, why can't, they, why can't they see? So there was all this thing. But Christian was a word that was come up with by people outside of the faith to describe these people. The term that people in the first century who followed Jesus used to describe themselves was the word disciple. The word disciple. And we said last week that disciple is a very serious word. Uh, and, and, be, and the reason is because it's clearly defined. You can call yourself a Christian and believe just about anything. You can call yourself a Christian today and adopt just about any kind of lifestyle. And if anyone challenges you, you can just say, wait, you know, I'm a Christian. And then you, you know, go off on, on your thing. But the difference between Christian, and so maybe if you get nothing else today, here's the bottom line. The difference between Christian and disciple is simply this. Christian is all about what you say you believe, but disciple is all about what you actually do with that. Christian is about what you say you believe, but disciple is what you actually do with, with all of that. And if you're a church person here today or watching, or you consider yourself a, a Christian, uh, you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you need to understand that people who are not followers of Jesus, who do not consider themselves Christians, they look at us, and sometimes they expect more out of us than we expect out of ourselves. And while we hide behind the label and say, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian, people on the outside of us look at us sometimes and say, yeah, but you don't look like Jesus, and you don't act like Jesus, and you don't talk like Jesus did. And I think that's why some people are simply not involved in a local church. They think they've seen it all. Oh, I know Christians. I've seen Christians. I, I know them. And they really want to see a group of people who act more like Jesus. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by any of this. It shouldn't shock us at all because it's not new. When you go back in the New Testament, if you were to ask Jesus himself, what is it, what is it like to be one of your followers? What does it mean? How will people know that, that we're your followers? I mean, what's going to be the defining characteristic? As he gathered his closest followers together right before he was going to die, he answered that in an unmistakably clear way. And, and that's why you're going to see today, Christian is an easy word to hide behind, but disciples not. Disciples not. 
So, so what I want to do today is I want to take us back about 2,000 years to a moment in time with Jesus when he speaks directly to the people who want to be his disciples. These are not just people interested. These are people who say, willing to do anything, as you'll see. And Jesus is going to talk to them. So it's the last night that Jesus is on earth before he's going to be crucified. He calls together his closest followers. And he says, if you're going to be serious about this, if you really want to be my disciple, here's the bottom line. And if you don't hear anything else that I've taught you over the last three years, and if you don't hear anything else that I'm going to tell you today, if you, if you don't do anything else I do, here is the specific order. And the thing that's not going to, the thing is, this is not going to be new information to you guys. You've heard it before more than one time. And this is what's so cool, church, and I want you to lock in here because Jesus is about to say something so amazing. And, I, and I've taught on this before, and some of you are going to go, oh, I kind of get it, but I want you to listen to the words of Jesus as he says them, all right? And I think it's important, and it's so amazing because it's been 2,000 years since Jesus spoke these words. And, and if, if the people who call themselves Christians and the people who call themselves disciples... And the people like us who say that we're followers of Jesus, if we had gotten this right, if over the last 2,000 years, if we had gotten this one teaching of Jesus right, if we had gotten this one part of being a follower of Jesus right, and I don't want to be, you know, go into hyperbole here, but if we had gotten this right, there may not have been a first world war. And there may not have been a second world war. And there certainly would not have been a civil war in our own country. Slavery would have been put to rest long before it did. There would have been no need for a civil rights movement in our country. If we had gotten this one thing right, there would not be the sex trafficking industry that there is today. There would not be this huge amount of conflict between wives and husbands. There would not be huge dysfunction within families if we had got this right. If the followers of Jesus had actually followed not the Ten Commandments and not even the whole New Testament, all right? But if we had gotten this one thing right over the last 2,000 years, I dare say that our world and our nation and our community and our homes would look very different than they do now. And they would be much better places. So here it is. Jesus on his last evening on earth. He's about to observe his last Passover with his Jewish followers and the apostles. And now he's about to be put on trial and he's about to be executed. And Judas has already left to go and betray him. And Jesus knows there's not much time, but he says there's something important that you guys got to know and there's something. And, and he takes his whole ministry and he narrows it down to one point And he says, there's one thing that you got to get right. And here it is. And we'll put it on the screen and I'll read for you. He says, my children, I will not, uh, excuse me, I will be with you only a little longer. Where I am going, you cannot come. So a new command I give you. A new command I give you. Now, it, that, that was in, when we translate that, that's from the Greek. And the Greek word new means something that's unusual. Something that wasn't there before, now it appears. It, it has the word has in the definition it, a strangeness, not strange in a bad way, but just strange that we've never heard this before. And these guys had heard the Ten Commandments. And they had heard the, the commandments that Moses had given. But he says, this is, this is it. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. Now, again, this part is not new. You, you can go back in the Old Testament and find where the Jews were told to love one another. And, and, and Jesus many times taught that we're to love one another. But he continues and he takes it a step further. And here it is. And this is where I want you to get today. He says, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Here it is. As I, Jesus, have loved you guys, that's how you love one another. In the same way that I have loved you, that's how you love one another. And I just think in my imagine that my imagination that Jesus kind of looked around the room at these guys and, uh, you know, and, and, and he looked over here at Matthew and he said, hey, Matthew, remember, you were a tax collector when I called you. You were considered a traitor 
by the Jewish people. People didn't want you around. There were guys that didn't want you to be one of my followers. You were hated. And, and, and after, I, after I called you, I, I, I went to your house, and there were other people there that were just like you and, and, and people that your parents you know, warned us about. Remember how that felt? And Matthew, do you remember how I loved you in spite of all of that? And he said, that's how I want you, Matthew, to love all of these guys. Right? And then he looked around, and there was Nathaniel. And Nathaniel's a guy we don't talk about a lot. He's not mentioned a whole lot. But he says, Nathaniel, you remember your brother met me, and, and he ran to tell you about me, and he told you to come and meet me, and, and that I was from Nazareth. And Nathaniel, do you remember what you said? The first thing that Nathaniel said when he heard about Jesus, he said this. He said, can any good thing come from Nazareth? Now, Nazareth was like a town or an area or region. So it's like, you know, it's like you tell someone you're from New Smyrna Beach or Edge, whatever, and people kind of look down their nose and go, really? You came from New Smyrna Beach? I mean, this was, people just didn't like the people uh, that were from Nazareth. And, and it's like, he would look at Nathaniel and say, Nathaniel, you like dissed my whole family, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but he would say, Nathaniel, do you remember how that didn't matter and I loved you anyway? And Nathaniel would say, yeah. And he'd say, Nathaniel, that's how I want you to love these guys from here on out. You see, by this, by this, all of those days, he looked at all the guys and said, all those days when, when I would do something, you would question me and you would question my motive. Remember, Jesus would do a miracle. They go, why'd you do that for him? You know, why didn't you do this? And, 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 and he, he looked at all of them and said, remember those days when you questioned you, me and you questioned my motives and what I was doing and why I was doing it? Do you remember how I treated you? That I didn't get angry and I didn't cut you off and I loved you anyway? He said, guys, that's how I want you to love each other. And I want it to be the, the way that your relationships with each other is characterized. And then Jesus added to it and he said, and by this, this love that you have for one another, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. By this, the way that you love one another is how everyone will know that you are my disciples. See, see this is way more than saying you're a Christian. All right? This narrows the focus a whole lot. And I don't know how you get around that. I mean, Jesus looked at these guys, and through the pages of history, he looks at you and I today, and he says, this is the way that people will know that you're one of my disciples, you're one of my pupils, you're one of my learners, you're one of my followers. If you love one another in the same way that I loved you, and this is my favorite part of this story. And, and, and this is big to these guys. Because think about what Jesus is not saying. All right? He's not saying, people will know you're one of my followers if you know a whole lot of the scripture. If you go to the right synagogue. I mean, it's not any of that. Okay? He said, the one defining characteristic of the people who follow me is not going to be how much they know about me. It's not going to be how loud or how long they sing. It's not going to be how loud or how long they pray. It's going to be all about if they love one another. And when Jesus narrows it like that, that makes this seemingly little thing a big deal. And I love it because, you know, Simon Peter was one of these guys, and pretty much every time you see him in the New Testament, you know, you ought to highlight your Bible and mark it or whatever. But he's always talking sometimes before he thinks. And so of all of that deep thing that Jesus just did, and you may even forget Jesus said this when I read him and go, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? <laughs> he said, well, where did that come from? Well, that's what Jesus said in here. He said, in a little while, I'll leave you, remember? I'm going to go away. In all of the thing about love one another, what Simon Peter heard was he's leaving. And he says, where are you going? And it's so funny because if you get into the scripture, then Peter, and you can read it yourself in John 13, Peter goes into this speech about how much he loves Jesus, and he said, Jesus, I'll even be willing to die for you. I'll even be willing to die for you. <laughs> and Jesus is saying to Peter, listen, I want you to do something that's way better than that, way more important than that, way more challenging than that. And you and I are going to sit around and say, wait a minute, if he's willing to die for him, I mean, what could be more important than dying for Jesus? 
What could be more important than, than, than um, you know, giving your life for him? <laughs> Jesus said, Peter, I want you to love these guys, all right, for the rest of your life. And listen, church, I want you to love them in such a way that people will look at your relationships. And I want you to be, uh, and they will be drawn into you and your community. I want them to look in and say, look how they love each other. Look how they love each other. And I want you to create a community of people who are defined and characterized by the kind of unconditional and compassionate and ridiculous love that people would look at you and say, who would love somebody like that? Who would love somebody like that? All right? Let me kind of paraphrase here and kind of fit it to us. All right? Jesus would say, I want people on the outside to come and see you and your community. Okay? To come and see. They're going to hear, we like to say, good rumors. Okay? And they're going to say, I need to see that. I've, I've heard about that. I need to see that. That they would come and see, unafraid that we're going to ask them to do anything. Unafraid that they're going to be dragged into something. Unafraid that we're going to accuse them of something. I want them to come and look in your community and say, look how well the men treat the women. And look how well the women treat the men. And look how they treat widows. And look how they treat sick people. And look how they treat poor people. And look how they treat slaves. And watch them when they're persecuted, how they respond. And look how they manage their resources. And look how they respond when people are angry at them. Look at them love. And Jesus wanted his followers, and he wants you and I. He would say to us, I want you to go out and build communities just like that. And those communities are going to grow, and they're going to expand, and people from the outside are going to, are going to be drawn to them. And they're going to think, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to become one of those people, but I wish those people lived next door to me. I wish those were the kind of neighbors I had. And, 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 you know, if you're an employer, you would think, well, I don't know if I believe what Joe or Bob or Sue believes, but I wish all of my employees were like them. I wish all of my employees were like them. And, you know, these followers of Jesus, when they mess up, they're honest. I mean, they're loyal to a fault. They tell the truth. They're generous. They're willing to do the right thing, even when it costs them. And I don't know if I would ever want to be one, but if I had a son or a daughter, I would sure want my son or daughter to marry somebody like that. Okay? See how they love each other. Can you imagine... Okay, let's bring it back to today. Can you imagine on your job? Can you imagine on your street? Can you imagine in your school if we got that one thing right? If we got that one thing right? If those of us who are here today and you that are watching, if we just decided we're going to be disciples and we're going to focus on one thing, we're going to love the people around us, the same way that Jesus loved us. Same way that Jesus loved us. How cool would that be? All right? Jen does our social marketing here. I thought, how cool would it be to have like a big rebranding campaign? You know, you've seen companies that have done that. They just change everything. You don't hear from them for like a year, and all of a sudden, boom. You know, here it is. Can you imagine if just in terms of family, if every husband and wife in every home that claimed to be Christian for the next three months, for the next six months, would just say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to love each other. We're just going to serve each other. You know, how can I serve you? What can I do for you? We're going to be generous. Can you imagine the change within your family if everybody in the family, that was their attitude? That was the idea. You, you ever see the little, the little commercial? I don't even know what it is. It's the little chocolate bars, and they have the two little girls, and they're saying, take a chocolate bar if you're the one that does this. And, 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 and so they're all, you know, grabbing at the bars, and they say, take, take a piece if, if you're the one that wants to share. You know, she reaches real quick, and then she shares real quick. I said, what if that was us? Instead of saying mine, what if we said, would you like this? Instead of saying, what can you do for me in our homes? If we just all just said, kids and parents, if we all just said, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? Can you imagine our nation? Can you imagine our nation? And listen, you know I'm not very political, but I think this is kind of, we're in a mess. Okay? 
we're in a mess and it's not one party's fault over another and it's not one person or man or woman's fault. I mean, we are in a mess, all right? But could you imagine in our nation if just the people who claim to be Christians, not everybody, if just the people who claim to be Christians were to say, tell you what, for a year, for one year, Let's forget about all of our issues. Let's forget politics. Let's forget my side and your side. Let's forget all of the rest of this because we're going to, for one year, focus on the one thing Jesus told us we're supposed to focus on. And we're just going to love and serve one another. We're just going to love and serve one another. You know, the crime rate would, rate would almost drop to zero. I mean, a house would catch on fire, and by the time the fireman got there, all of the neighbors would already have the fire put out. You know, what can I do? What can, I mean, something would happen in someone, and everyone would rush to, you know, now something happens and everybody backs off and films it. But what if everybody said, forget my phone, let's go help? I mean, what if, what if we did something like that? What if we said as a nation, just the Christians now in our nation, for the next year, we're just going to love the people around us the way that Jesus loved us. The way that Jesus loved us. Can you imagine? <laughs> it's like almost impossible, isn't it? It's just hard. Hard to imagine that. Jesus said, by this one thing, this is how everybody on the outside is going to know that you're really my follower. Not how long you pray. Not how many Bible studies you have. Not how long you preach. Not what the sign says in front of where you meet, but how well you love each other. Okay? How well you love each other. Two things, and I'll be done. If you're in here today, if you're watching online, and you are a follower of Jesus, okay? You should try this, what I just said, okay? This week, and I hear all the excuses already, all right? I, I know your, your wife is a wreck. I know your husband's a mess, okay? I know that. I know your teenagers are teenagers. Uh, <laughs> I know that your kids are, are off the wall. I realize that. I know that at work you're surrounded by crazy people. You know that song, clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. You know, that's where you work, right? I know the other students at school are just so weird. I know all of that. I know that you are the only balanced person in your world. I know that. I recognize that. But let me just ask you this. What would it look like this week if you just loved all of those people the same way that Jesus loved you? Okay, just for a week, what would it look like? And again, how many times have we read in the scriptures when Jesus, who was God in the flesh, who knew everything, he, he, knew, what, he knew what people were thinking. And, and, and it was so crazy because he was always surrounded by these apostles that we like think are like spiritual superheroes. And these guys are all arguing and they're bickering. You know, who gets to sit closest to Jesus and, you know, all of this goofy kind of stuff going on. And, and, you know, Jesus could have just said, ah, and, you know, he didn't use that as an excuse. He just loved him anyway. Okay? So what if the next week, you who claim to be a follower of Jesus, what if for the next week or 10 days you say, you know what, I'm going to quit taking my cue from the culture around me about how to treat people. And so to the best of my ability, by God's grace, I'm going to be an overtop, ridiculous lover of the people in my family, of the people that I come in contact with at work, of the people I see it, you know, out in public, all of these kinds of things, the people I bump into at the store. And I just dare you to try it, okay? You guys in here, you guys online that say that you're followers of Jesus. And let me tell you, it <laughs> doesn't mean everything's going to go perfect, okay? It doesn't mean everything's going to go perfect. I mean, it didn't go perfect for Jesus. You remember, they, they crucified him, all right? So, so get ready. It may not come back to you. Everybody may not treat you like you treated them. But that's not what this is about. This is about following Jesus and doing what Jesus would do and saying what Jesus would say and being what Jesus would be. And Jesus said, this is what it means to follow me. And I would just say, if you're serious about this, this is way better than being a Christian. Because this is how you change the world without firing a shot. Without firing a shot. Now, the other group that I want to talk to you today, all right? And, and if this isn't you, you probably know someone who feels this way, so everyone listen. I want to talk 
to those of you who because of some experience that you've had with a Christian or something you've seen a Christian do or something you've heard a Christian say, because of that you think that Christians are narrow-minded and are homophobic and are greedy and are mean and are judgmental. Um, I hear you. I, I often tell a story of getting on an airplane going to Atlanta from here and um, reading a book and the guy next to me is one of the talkers and I'm usually not on a plane but he said what are you reading and it was a Christian book and I went back to it and he said I used to go to church and I closed my book and started listening to him and he went for about 20 minutes of his experience in church and when he got done I said you know if that had ever happened to me I would never go to church again the rest of my life okay and there's people out there and it may not be you or you that are watching but you know someone that because of what they have heard a Christian say or a Christian did to them or a church experience, they say, I'm never going back. And, and I get it, okay? I have no judgment at all against you. But here's my hope for you. And everybody listen to this. Here's my hope for you guys that have been hurt. No one will probably ever be able to redefine Christian for you in a way that you will ever want to be one. And that's not even my goal today, but I would just hope with all that you've seen and experienced, I just hope that, you'll, that you won't miss Jesus because of Christians. I hope that you won't miss Jesus because Jesus, the Savior, when he looks at us, he puts us all on common ground, all right? And, and, and the thing that you may hate about me and the thing that you may think that you hate about other Christians actually is the thing that you hate about yourself. And that's this that all of us fall short. And we don't just fall short of God's standards. We all fall short of our own standards. I'm not even consistent with what I say, I believe. And none of you are consistent with what you say that you believe. So we have a common ground. And whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, all of us have to figure out what to do with our failure. And what to do with our disappointment, even with ourselves. And what to do with our sin. And what to do with the distance that we all sometimes feel from God. And I would hate the fact that Christianity has been so poorly represented to you that you miss Jesus. And you miss what he's done for you. And I don't say that because I think I'm better than anyone else. I say that because I've read what Jesus said. And I see that Jesus came so that we might have life and that he offers it freely to everyone. So don't miss Jesus because of Christians. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for our time together again this morning. And um, God, very convicting thought here. What if I was to do what Jesus said to do for just a week in just my family? in just my workplace, in just my school situation, in just the club or organization I'm in. And God, that seems so strange to us and it seems even a little scary because we've never done that. We realize we've never done that. We, we tend to treat people the way they treat us and um, even though we claim to be people that are followers of Jesus who loved everyone no matter how they treated him. And, and, and I just pray that we take each other up on this, that we do this. And, and, and Father, I pray that you'll help us to be obedient to you and that this will be a habit in our life and that our families will change and that our community and our friends will begin to change and that our state and our nation will begin to change and that our world can change because it's happened before when a group of people took very seriously the words of Jesus Christ, and just begin to love one another. Not stand up against the empire, but just begin to love each other the way that Jesus loved them. And it didn't take long, and that empire fell without firing a shot. And so God, we pray for this revolution of love that Jesus called us to. God, help me to not worry about whether anybody else is going to do it or not. Help me to make sure that I'm doing it. And may each of us do that when we leave this place today. Father, we're thankful for this church, for what it stands for, what it represents. 
We're thankful for Jesus today. We pray for people of our church family that are hurting, going through all kinds of different situations, whether it's physical or emotional or uh, financial, spiritual. Um, God, I just pray that you would meet the needs of each and every one of us. We thank you for loving us in Jesus. Pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 It's not my life to live It's not my song to sing And all I have is His For all eternity It's not my righteousness It's not my faithfulness And all I have is His For all eternity And we will crown Him, crown Him King of glory Oh, what love is this? He won't. 